Thank you, Beth. Hello, my name is Mike Shaw, and I'm the box office and sales manager for Writers Theatre. We are incredibly grateful um, to be partnering with Highland Park Public Library and to Beth Keller here um, for helping making today's event possible. And we're thrilled to have all of you with us here today. This is one event from our From Page to Sage series, um, which we're offering in conjunction with North Shore Public Libraries. The series serves to illuminate themes and content from one of the plays in our season. This year, we are focusing on the Diary of Anne Frank, performing in our intimate bookstore space here through um, August 2nd. Many of you are familiar with the story of Anne Frank, uh, of the Diary of Anne Frank. Um, her story is just as vital today um, as it was when it was written. Um, it has become a very essential part of how we remember one of the darkest periods of human history. Filled with this young author's luminous spirit, her boundless desire for all that is beautiful and good, um, the diary illuminates the coming of age of a complex and passionate young girl. Um, while she falls in love, grows into a woman, and struggles to survive with her family and the chaos of war and religious persecution. It is a wonderful story that we are very, very happy and thrilled to be able to share with our audiences. And uh, we are very, very thrilled um, to be able to be here today again with this event. And I thank Beth Keller, who will now introduce our next part of the program for you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, and congratulations, because I know you guys just extended the production, to, so congratulations on that. Um, tonight, we're also pleased to have with us historian and author Joan Adler. She's the director of the Strauss Historical Society in New York. The Historical Society fosters educational activities with respect to the settlement of Jews in the United States, and in particular, the family of Lazarus and Sarah Strauss, their ancestors and their descendants. The focus of the society's activities and the Strauss family is based on the family's involvement in government, commerce, and philanthropy. Joan is also the author of For the Sake of the Children, the Letters Between Otto Frank and Nathan Strauss, Jr., which she'll discuss tonight. Following the program, she has the book for sale at the table in front, and she'll be signing copies. A quick note about a couple of upcoming programs. On Friday, May 15th, Debut author Aline Ohanassian will discuss her new book, Or Hands Inheritance, a library journal editor's pick. Join us for a brown bag discussion about her book, which is based on the story of her grandparents who are, were Armenian genocide survivors. Bring your lunch and we'll provide dessert for you. Then on Wednesday, May 20th at 7, we're hosting best-selling author, National Book Award, and Pulitzer Prize winner Joseph Ellis. He's discussing his new book, the Quartet, orchestrating the Second American Revolution, 1783 to 1789. Now I'd like to introduce Joan Adler. Thanks, Joan. Thank you, Beth. I think I'm going to leave the mic here, and we'll see how that works. Um, it was a great introduction, and I appreciate the amount of information that you gave to all these people, and of course I thank all of you for coming out tonight. Those of you who saw Anne Frank yesterday will find this talk even more important as we fill in some of the Otto Frank family history. Um, I'm going to add a really truly new dimension to that history. For the sake of the children, refers to this book that I've written about the relationship and the letters between Otto Frank and Nathan Strauss, Jr. As my talk pro progresses, You'll come to understand who these men were, how truly compelling the story is, and why no one else but me could tell it. Now we are technologically phobic, so we're hoping that this is all going to work. Ah, uh, there we go. Evo, the Institute for Jewish Research, was founded in Vilna, Poland in 1925 and moved to New York in 1940. Its mission is to preserve, study, and teach the cultural history of Jewish life throughout Eastern Europe, Germany, and Russia. And here we have the building, the Vilna bu building of Evo. Today, it's located in New York City, and it's one of the sister organizations of the Center for Jewish History on East 16th Street. If anybody is in New York, it's well worth a visit to this amazing institution. In 2007, a file of letters was accidentally discovered at Evo in a warehouse. It was part of a collection of materials that had been donated by Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. 
They donated the historical files to Evo, even though they are an ongoing concern and still have other materials, but all of the historical materials went to Evo. They were in storage, and a volunteer had been going through those files looking to see what they had in preparation for adding the files to Evo's catalog. She came across a file folder that had no indication of what was inside, and at that time, all of the file folders were supposed to have the name of the individuals and maybe a date or something pertinent on the outside. So she looked inside and found that they were letters that Otto Frank had written. And she was very excited about this. There were about 85 letters in this file that had been stored since about 1945 and no one had seen them. Incredible. Closer inspection revealed what was going on with these letters. And I'm going to be speaking about those tonight. That's the topic of my book. The letters were written during a little known period in the lives of the Frank family. From December, from April through December of 1941. This was 15 months before the Frank family went into hiding. The story they tell is both heartbreaking and inspiring. I find it amazing that after all that's known about Anne Frank and her family for all of these years, nobody knew how hard Otto Frank tried to get his family out of Europe and how hard Nathan Strauss Jr. tried to help. This is entirely new information. When Otto Frank finally realized how desperate his family situation was, he turned to his college roommate and lifelong friend for assistance getting his family out of Nazi-dominated Europe. I'm going to give you a brief biography of these two men, and then I'll talk about their letters. I'm going to make an assumption that you all know who Otto Frank was, the father of the diarist Anne Frank, that you know at least something about World War II and about their lives during the war. The period I'm going to be speaking about again is 15 months before the Frank family went into hiding. The first letter in this stack of letters was written April 30th, 1941. In 1959, a powerful movie opened in New York City, The Diary of Anne Frank. And I remember seeing it with a group of my friends. As Anne and her family were being led away from their hiding place in the attic, I sobbed uncontrollably. And I thought, why didn't they get out? Why didn't they get out when they had a chance? And truly, that question haunted me for 50 years. For the past 25 years, I've been the Strauss family historian. It's the Strauss family that originated in the Rhine Falls area of Germany. They owned R.H. Macy's. Family members Isidore and Ida Strauss went down on Titanic. And I tell you this so that you know the family I'm speaking about. It is not the family of Levi Strauss. It's an entirely different family. <coughs> Someone always asks about that. One of the more interesting aspects of my work is doing research. Because the family members contribute their materials to our archive, I read a lot about what was going on in the family members' lives. But because I have this material, it always leads to more interesting... I keep forgetting about this. It leads to more interesting research. I have to find out. I learned something, and then I need to learn something more. And one of the things I've done is contribute information to other institutions, like Anne Frank Fonds, Fonds Meets Foundation in Basel, Switzerland. And because of our willingness to share this information, they have shared information with us. We've worked with several authors because of our willingness to share. And indeed, again, they have given us materials as well. When the file of letters was discovered at Evo, it was known that we were the Strauss Historical Society and we were contacted and given a pre-release copy of all of these letters. One of my jobs is writing a newsletter for the Strauss Historical Society. We have business cards and brochures and you can pick those up if you're interested in reading that article or other information about the family. So I wrote a newsletter 
for the Strauss Historical Society, and I sent a copy of it to Buddy Elias of Anne Frank Fonz. He was the nephew of Otto Frank. And he said, I will give you a grant for anything you'd like to do relating to these letters. And like an idiot, I said, oh, I think I'd like to write a book. I had not written a book before, so this was quite, a, a, it, it even surprised me that I suggested that I could do this. But once I'd made the, equip, the, the commitment, I had to do it, and it really turned out to be an amazing experience. So as, as you've heard, copies of the book will be for sale afterward, and I'd be happy to sign them. Today, I'm going to tell you about the folder of letters that for the first time reveal how hard Otto Frank really did try to get his family out of there. But in order to do that, I have to start with a biography of the two men. I'll talk about the events between April and December of 41 as they relate to these two men and their families. And it'll be necessary for me to read to you from the letters. And I know it's not really interesting to sit there and watch somebody read, but there is no way I could possibly do justice to these letters without quoting directly from them. I'll talk about what happened to the families during the war and then after the war. So let's begin. Otto Heinrich Frank was born May 12, 1889 in Frankfurt. He was the second of four children. And here we have a photograph of all four Frank children. Otto was especially close with Lenny. Her name was Helene and he called her Lenny. The youngest and his only sister. His father owned the Michael Frank Bank in Frankfurt that had been in the family for generation. Theirs was a life of culture. The children studied languages, learned to play instruments, rode horses, went to the opera with their parents, and attended private preparatory schools. And although they strongly identified with their Jewish co-religionists, they didn't attend the synagogue or worship there. Their religion was just another aspect of their identity. They considered themselves Germans first. Otto was popular with his classmates. I'm sure it says something else there. Yep, okay. His parents taught him that tolerance was important. And in the early 20th century in Germany, many prominent Jews considered themselves Germans before thinking of their Jewish identity. And of course, this led to huge problems later when Hitler came into power. But that was later. In Otto Frank's youth and throughout his, the First World War, the Frank family enjoyed full German citizenship and all of its privileges. In the fall of 1908, Otto Frank attended Heidelberg University, where his college roommate was a man called Charles Webster Strauss, who was later known as Nathan Strauss Jr. And I'll tell you about that name change later, I promise. He studied economics because, of course, his father owned a bank and he was preparing for a career in banking. But he left after three semesters because he felt that the coursework was too theoretical. And here we have Otto Frank at about 10 years old. And this is his simple little home, Anne Frank for Germany. And now we turn to Charlie, Charles Webster Strauss. Here we have Charles Webster Strauss on the far left, his mother Lena. Father Nathan, younger brother Hugh Grant Strauss, named after the mayor of New York City, and sister Sissy Strauss. This is in their New York City apartment. Each room in the apartment had a different name, so this one was called the Pompeian Room. This is the front room, also a simple little house. Charlie was born the same year as Otto Frank, 1889. He was, his father was the owner of Macy's and Abraham and Strauss in Brooklyn. He was also known for pasteurization, for pasteurization. Oh, I'm sorry, Nathan Strauss, the senior, was known for bringing pasteurization for the world. He was a great philanthropist. And here we have Charles Webster Strauss, about the same age as the picture I showed you of Otto Frank. You can notice his simple little outfit. Most children today look like that, right? <laughs> and since I shared a home with, from the Franks, here's the country home, simple little home. This is in Westchester County, just north of New York City. And here we have the two men about the time that they attended Heidelberg University. 
And this is a certificate showing their attendance. It says that they both studied philosophies, which I understand means that, that they studied economics. In 1908, Charlie was enrolled at Princeton University in New Jersey, but he was dissatisfied with the program, and he decided to spend a year in Heidelberg, where Otto Frank became his roommate. They attended classes together and spent many evenings with Charlie's parents, who were in Heidelberg to spread the word about pasteurization. And he said Otto was his closest friend during these three semesters at Heidelberg, and that his parents liked, Charles, liked Otto the best of all of his friends. From 1909 to 1911, Nathan Strauss, Charlie's father, invited Otto Frank to come to New York and work at his store. He said Otto could have a good future there. After working at, for the Strausses at Macy's, he decided to try banking, which his father encouraged because he said he would learn about international economy and also his language, his English skills would be improved. But in 1911, Otto Frank had to return to Germany because his father had died and he felt a responsibility to family and he went to work in Germany. In August, Otto was called into military service in Germany. This is World War I. In 1923, he opened a branch of the Michael Frank Bank in Amsterdam, which also failed, but it did provide him with contacts for later, and later he did move to Amsterdam. And so now he, he had a place to live and people that he knew and when, he, when he decided it was time to leave. And here we have Otto Frank in his military uniform during World War II. Oh, World War I, I apologize. We've been doing a lot of work about World War II lately, so it's on my mind. Okay, now we turn to Charlie. In 1910, he returned and went to Princeton where he graduated. As soon as his 21st birthday arrived, he legally changed his name to Nathan Strauss Jr. in preparation for a career in politics. His father was much revered because of his philanthropic activities, and Nathan Jr. wanted to take advantage of that name recognition. It gave everybody three months to start calling him Nathan. And there were only two people who refused. One was his sister-in-law, Hugh Grant Strauss's wife, Flora Stieglitz Strauss, who said like this, she said, she said, and I did it just to annoy him. <laughs> and the other person was Otto Frank, who till the end of his days always called him Charlie, and that was okay. In 1910, Nathan Jr., who I will call Nathan Jr. from now on, worked at the New York Globe, a New York newspaper, after graduation. He was preparing first for, a, until he could get into politics, he thought maybe he would like uh, the newspaper field publishing. But in 1911, he left that to work at Macy's because his father had suffered a, ner a nervous breakdown. Remember, in 1911, Otto Frank also felt a responsibility to the family and went back to Germany. So there, the history's parallel quite a lot. In 1913, he bought the humorous magazine Puck, which is very much like today's New Yorker magazine. I don't know if you get that here or if you are familiar with it, but it's a glossy with intellectual articles and, and uh, cartoons and, and art. In 1914, Nathan was in Munich to buy artwork for his periodical when the war broke out, and he became stranded in Europe. And where did he go? To Amsterdam. But he was lucky, he was able to get out. Later, of course, we know that Otto had a different experience. And here we have a photo of Nathan Jr. and his brother Hugh Grant. Nathan's the one standing. Both of them volunteered to serve during World War I, but Nathan had poor eyesight and his brother had poor hearing. But because of their father's connection, they were both able to secure desk jobs, and at least they, feel, they felt that they had made a contribution. And I just threw these in because I love these photos. These are the wedding photos. We know that the men were close and stayed close. This is a picture from 1928 when Nathan Jr., who now had four children, was uh, vacationing with the Frank family. Uh, his sister Lenny had moved to Basel, and the Seals Marie, Switzerland, is quite near Basel, and so the families were all vacationing together. This was the year before Anne was born. And here we have Otto and Edith and Margot at that time. And Otto and his daughters a little bit later. 
Conditions in Europe were deteriorating. Otto and his family were forced to move further and further out of central Frankfurt. Their world kept shrinking. Otto managed to keep upbeat, protecting his family from the evils that began to close in around him. In April of 1932, he wrote to his sister Lenny in Basel, quote, there is no telling where we're headed. The only bright spot is the children who are sweet and take my mind off our troubles, unquote. In January of 33, Hitler was elected chancellor. He promised the German population dominance in international business affairs and a new era of national pride. There was a nationwide boycott of Jewish businesses and new laws were enacted to prevent Jews from participating in business or social life in Germany. Jews who thought they were Germans and would not face discrimination were now beginning to realize how wrong they were. And in 1933, the Frank family moved to Amsterdam, where Otto, a mature man, had to start over. He wrote, the world around me has collapsed. When most of the people in any country turned into hordes of nationalistic, anti-Semitic criminals, I had to face the consequences. And although this hurt me deeply, I realized that Germany was not the world, and I left forever. I get chills. His family bank had failed. The economy was in a shambles. Jews were no longer permitted to work, nor were their children permitted to attend the public schools. His family bank... Oh. FDR tried to get the Germans to allow the Jews to emigrate, and the Germans at that time were all too happy to get rid of all their Jews, but they had to leave without taking any of their possessions with them. And these were families who had successful businesses for generations and identified strongly as Germans and felt that if they could just hold on, things would be okay. Particularly Otto was a tremendous optimist. He felt if he could just hold on, he'd be okay. They'd weather this. The family moved to Wetter Plain 37 in Amsterdam. It's an area that was rapidly expanding. As new immigra immigrants were finding their way, it wasn't a Jewish area but simply an area of people who were starting over from all over Europe. And the children adapted quite well. It was only Edith who had difficulty. The children learned Dutch and they, they made friends and seemingly were quite happy at that time. Edith never did learn Dutch and was pretty miserable. With the help of a loan from his brother-in-law, Eric Elias, Lenny's husband, who was then the manager of a switch branch of Opecta, Otto opened the Dutch branch. It's a business concentrated on selling pectin, the gelling agent for making jams. And slowly, look, life took on a sense of normalcy. Within the next few years, although economic conditions were difficult, Otto managed to build his business. And he said that working in Amsterdam was much harder than in Germany. In Germany, he'd come home, have a huge lunch, take a nap, and then later in the afternoon, go back. Here he worked from day from morning until evening without a break, traveling all over, trying to build his business. In 1938, Otto applied for immigration visas in Rotterdam for himself and his family. He wanted to immigrate to the United States, but so did many others. The waiting list by 1939 was more than 300,000 people. He was a German living in the Netherlands and therefore fell under the American quota for Germans. And by now, the Americans were becoming xenophobic, afraid of foreigners, and especially intolerant of anyone who was German. They worried that German spies would be sent to their country. And they also worried that too many immigrants meant jobs would be taken away from Americans. That sounds pretty familiar to me. <laughs> Up until that time, there were few instances of open anti-Semitism in the Netherlands, and when it did occur, it was most likely verbal rather than physical. The Franks were more concerned about intolerance because they were Germans than because they were Jews. But the situation in Europe was deteriorating, and people were, felt they were forced to leave their country. But they were the lucky ones. Once the borders closed, conditions for Jews all over Europe deteriorated. In May of 40, Germany invaded Luxembourg, France, and the Netherlands, and the Dutch city of Rotterdam fell. At first, the Dutch people supported their Jewish neighbors. But as that conditions worsened and repercussions for offering assistance to Jews became more violent, the Dutchmen withdrew that support. People stopped associating with Jewish people, and that really made them isolated. And by 1940, 
immigrants from Europe were flooding into the United States and the Latin American countries. By June, tightening visa control closed most of the options for would-be immigrants. Everyone had to show he was unlikely to engage in radical activities and have sufficient means to support himself in a new country, which generally meant sponsorship by a relative in a new country. He had to show he had a good reason not only to leave where he was, but he also had to show he had a good reason to enter the United States. Large sums of money could be deposited in the immigrant's name in order to help secure that spot. Otto thought it was too late to leave. The only possible escape was by boat from the coastal cities near Rotterdam or La Harab. He didn't have a car, and he didn't think he could reach the coast. And he thought it was too difficult to move his family of five, himself, a wife, two daughters, and a mother-in-law who had cancer. He also felt that he couldn't leave her behind. And although each day brought new dangers and indignities, the F Frank family tried to live a normal life under the circumstances. Otto felt this was important for the children. Accounts differ about what transpired during the latter part of March and April of 1941. But what is clear is that the situation became desperate. Otto finally realized that he would have to take drastic action. He was no longer safe. He employed many people at his pectin and spice company, and he later wrote that one of them, a man named Jensen, reported to the Bureau of National Security that Otto has expressed the view that the war would go on for a long time and that Germany was having a tough time of it. On April 18th, Tani Allers, a young man with connections to the Dutch Nazi party, visited Otto at Opecta. And he stated that he was a courier between the Dutch Nazis and the German SS. He questioned Otto about the letter, stating that Otto Frank made remarks that were insulting to the German Wehrmacht. After Otto received the letter from Tony Allers, Allers said, I will remember what was in that letter, and at any point I can come back and turn you in. Otto realized that the blackmail would not stop. He became constantly afraid of the new complaints would be filed against him. After Tony Allers left, Otto Frank wrote to Nathan Strauss asking for assistance leaving Netherlands. And this is the first letter in the file dated April 30th, 1941. I would not ask if conditions would not force me to do all I can in time to be able to avoid worse. It is for the sake of the children, mainly, that we have to care for. Our own faith is, not, is less of less importance. The blackmail incident awakened Otto to the danger of staying in Europe. He realized that if he and his family were unable to leave Holland, they would need a safe place to hide. And so this is when he began preparing the attic in Prince Ingrat 263, with the full support of, and cooperation of his trusted staff at OPECA. I should tell you about these redacted areas in the letter and some of the others that you'll see. Evo decided that some of the content of these letters was so sensitive mostly meaning that Otto Frank was talking in a more emotional state about what was happening, and they felt that maybe people should not see this. It's their decision. Those people who were given the letters initially had to sign a paper saying that we would never disclose what was in there. When I started to write this book, I was given permission to use some of the material in the redacted areas in my book, and so if you care to read the book later, you will find information that is not contained in the, in the letters that can be released to the public because, because of these redacted areas. Otto asked his friend, Nathan Jr., if he would agree to make a bank deposit for his passage as requested by the consul. You are the only person I know that I can ask. When Otto Frank's letter arrived in April of 1941, Nathan Jr. was administrator of the United States Housing Attorney Authority in Washington, D.C., under FDR and a great friend of Eleanor Roosevelt. Various family members of the Strausses had already sponsored many of their relatives and friends, sending the necessary affidavits and making the required bank deposits to ensure that they would be allowed to leave Europe. To this day, it's not uncommon to learn of some family member who believes that his life 
and that of his entire family was saved because of their intervention. Nathan Jr.'s sister, Sissy Strauss Lehman, was particularly active in this, and there is a family story, we don't know if it's absolutely true, that at some point the State Department said to her, stop, nobody can have that many relatives. <laughs> But we do know many, many family members who were rescued by the Strausses. Sometimes, to, oh, it's important to remember that this was a time before email, Twitter, Instagram, and texting. And it's very important to remember that. We've become very used to having our very, every communication acted upon instantly. In 1941, that wasn't possible. Letters often took more than two, le two weeks to arrive at their overseas destinations. And when requests for assistance were made by hopeful emigres, every suggestion had to be researched before being acted upon. And this took time before a response could be formulated, and then a letter had to be composed and mailed. And sometimes that took two or three weeks. During that time, conditions in Europe were deteriorating. Often the situation changed so dramatically that the resolution decided upon was voided by a new set of regulations. After receiving the letter from Otto Frank, Nathan's wife, Helen Sack Strauss, wrote to Augusta Mayerson, who was acting director of the Migration Department of the National Refugee Service. May 1928, notice that date. After all the letters, requests for help we've had from people we hardly know, the enclosed one from Mr. Otto Frank from my husband's best friend during the university years, an extraordinarily fine man, and she asked what could be done to help them. Note the dates, April 30th, Otto Frank's letter, this one, May 28th. The Strauss's home was in New York City, but they were living at the showroom in Washington, D.C., while Nathan was the housing administrator. Mail arrived in New York, was collected, bundled, and sent to Washington, where it was opened and sorted and the most urchin mail on top of the pile. We have no way of knowing how long it was before Nathan actually received and read the first letter from Otto Frank. We can only imagine that most of the month was wasted before they ever received that first letter. Conditions in Europe, again, were deteriorating. After speaking with Helen Sack Strauss, Augusta Mayer suggested the following. One, that Nathan Jr. write a letter directly to Otto Frank letting him know they were preparing the requested affidavits for him and for his family. Two, a cover letter would be sent to the American consul in Amsterdam stating the reason for their interest in the Frank family and their concern for their welfare. A deposit of $5,000 would be sent. Man, this is 1941 money. Three, Miss Mayerson would write to Edith Frank's brothers, Julius and Walter Hollander, who were in Massachusetts, telling them of the Strauss's interest and suggesting that since the Strausses weren't relatives, that the Hollander brothers also send affidavits of support. Miss Mayerson's agency would cable the committee abroad with regard to the matter of the steamship reservation. She suggested that perhaps the Franks could turn over sufficient funds to give them special consideration for the purchase of their tickets. And she wanted to know the name of each person, their age, their occupation, and their earning capacity. I always find that a little interesting. Miss Mayerson on June 3rd wrote several letters, and one was to Maurice Krinsky, who was in Boston, helping refugees. And he asked them about Walter and Julius Hollander, about their situation and their ability to help. Walter and Julius were Edith's brothers. Shortly after Kristallnacht, in November of 38, they were both arrested in Aachen, Germany, the family's ancestral home. And Julius was quickly released because he was wounded in World War I. But Walter wasn't so lucky. He was sent to Sachsenhausen, a concentration camp. But remember, in those days, concentration camps were not killing machines. People were sent there as a labor, for labor, or to just isolate them from the rest of the population. Walter was told that he would be released if he could prove that he had a way to leave Germany. He was transferred to Dutch camp, Zeeburg, not far from Amsterdam. And when Walter was released from Sachsenhausen, he was given a threatening message that if he ever told anyone in the outside world what had occurred, what he'd seen, 
the Germans would hunt him down, find him anywhere in the world, and bring him back. Walter and Julius were able to obtain affidavits from an uncle who had previously emigrated to America. And in fact, that, that could only be called perversion. The Nazis, who made it impossible for the Hollander brothers to stay, even demanded that they leave, required them to deposit 2,070 Reich marks into an account for the Reich Minister of Commerce as a tax for their abandonment of the Reich. Incredible. That's about $13,000 in today's money, just to give you some sense. Maurice Krinsky located both Hollander brothers, investigated their living conditions, income, and business prospects. Both brothers had recently immigrated and didn't have sufficient income to support the Frank family. Like the Franks, the Hollanders had owned a successful business that had been in the family for generations. It must have been quite a shock to find themselves doing menial labor in two different factories in the United States. Nathan said he would put up the necessary money to help the Frank family emigrant. There was concern that the Frank family was too large for one sponsor. So Julius and Walter's employees submitted affidavits of support for Margot and Anne. And this is remarkable because both men were doing menial labor at different times at different firms, and they'd not been at them for very long, and neither employer was Jewish. And yet both employers found it in their hearts to offer affidavits, one for Margot and one for Anne. The Hollander brothers agreed to sponsor their mother, Rosa, who was living with the Franks. And Nathan sent a letter, letter of sponsorship with the required affidavits for Otto and Edith. Now the entire family has sponsorship. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? If only it were that easy. This is where I start to tear up. On June 25th, Augusta Mayerson writes to Nathan Jr. In view of the recent executive orders which came through with reference to visa applicants, we did not feel that there was any point in forwarding the affidavits that you kindly executed on behalf of this family. As you know, a new type of affidavit will now have to be prepared after July 1st, 1941. Moreover, affidavits will now be evaluated in the visa division of the State Department, who will pass upon the adequacy of these. It is only after the State Department reaches a decision that the American Consul Abroad is notified of such approval and may then issue a visa to the applicants. We realize that the consulate offices closing in Germany and German-occupied territories, the Franks and Mrs. Hollander may have some difficulty in applying for visas. But we are hopeful that the German authorities will permit refugees who are ready to leave the country to go to a place where a consulate office is functioning. Remember, Rotterdam was bombed, and the consulate, the American consulate, was closed. Every person and every agency involved agreed to do what was necessary to bring the Frank family to America. All the paperwork was completed, but the change in the form caused a two-week delay in the papers being sent and those two weeks were critical. June 30th, Otto wrote to Charlie, I received your kind letter of June 4th and have to thank you again and again for all you are doing. You already did more than I thought could be done. It is a pity that for the present, all efforts will be useless as the American consulate in Rotterdam is leaving and nobody knows as yet if things will be handled further or not. So we have to wait. Bad luck, but it cannot be helped. Let us hope that conditions will get more normal again. As soon as I hear that there are chances still, I shall let you know. And you certainly will be informed better than I that the possibilities will remain. The American Consul General suspended action on visas on June 30th. On July 1st, Nathan wrote to Anna, I have taken up the matter of your immigration to this country with the National Refugee Service. I have also discussed it with the State Department officials, as I would very much like to help you. I am afraid the news is not good news. Unless you can get to a place where there is an American consul, there does not seem to be any way of arranging for you to come over. I am informed that there are still American consuls in Portugal, Spain, Free France, and Switzerland. These are the only countries in which a visa can be arranged. Otto wrote to Charlie on September 8th, and we can see that Otto has finally understood how desperate his family situation is. The only way to get to a neutral 
excuse me, countries or visas of other states, such as Cuba. I know that it is impossible for all of us to leave, even if most of the money is refundable. But Edith urges me to leave alone or with the children. Can you imagine he's worrying about money at this point? Nathan wrote to Otto on September 11th, I am prepared to submit the necessary affidavits of support just as soon as you are able to assure me that you can leave Holland and get permission to go to a country where there is an American consul. Nathan suggested that his friend call in the Jewish Council for Amsterdam for possible assistance. And although America and Germany were not officially at war, relations between the two countries were strained. Any aliens from Germany were considered undesirable, even though they were trying to flee because of the German policies. Back in the United States, Nathan worked diligently to accumulate the information, and the National Refugee Service was investigating every option. On September 17th, Julius Hollander wrote to Nathan, I have information that transit visas for Cuba are available again. I would appreciate it if you would assist me in obtaining a visa for Mr. Otto Frank as soon as possible. My brother and I will share expenses with you. It would be impossible for us to obtain an immigration visa for this country without your assistance. A telegram was sent by Augusta Meyerson on September 19th to the Jewish Council for Amsterdam, and it read, Can Otto Frank, Moretta Plan 37, acquire secure exit permit transit visa Spain? Friend preparing affidavits. Cable reply. Ms. Meyerson wrote to Nathan on October 2nd to let him know that there had been no answer to this cable. In view of the fact that chances for immigration to the United States for persons in occupied areas is so poor, Mr. Hollander presents through his letter to you an alternate plan. This is the immigration of the Frank family to Cuba. Because of the fluctuating administrative rule in the Cuban government, the National Refugee Service does not take responsibility for negotiating for these visas. There are always risks involved where Cuba is concerned. Perhaps Ms. Mayerson is refer referring to the ill-fated journey of the St. Louis, a ship of Jewish refugees bound for Cuba in May 1939. The president tightened immigration regulations and refused to let the refugees disembark when they arrived, even though each possessed a tourist visa for Cuba. These refugees were taken to South America, where each country also refused them entry. They even sailed up the eastern coast of the United States before being turned away. The United States had already filled its German quota, and the administration was afraid to risk the anger of Congress by taking in more refugees. The ship returned to Europe, where Britain, France, Belgium, and Netherlands each took a portion of the 933 passengers, and about 30% of those perished in the Holocaust. The next suggestion was that Julius Hollander was to, to bring over only the children. He and his brother would pay for their boat ticket, and he asked Nathan to put up the necessary deposit, which he promised to return as soon as possible. Letters and cables continued to be sent, but in each case, everyone was in agreement. Everyone wanted to help the Frank family reach America, and nothing could be done to expedite their immigration. On October 12th, the Jewish Council for Amsterdam wrote to the National Refugee Service. As Mr. Strauss has written himself that the State Department will accept his affidavit, Mr. Otto Frank is of the opinion that he perhaps need not go to Cuba at all. And on October 12th, Otto wrote to Nathan, It is all much more difficult as one can imagine, and getting more complicated every day. Augusta Meyerson wrote to Julius on October 17th, We are informed by the German Jewish Children's Aid Incorporated that it is almost impossible for them to bring out children at this time from Amsterdam. In view of the ultimate plan, which is, as we understand it, to bring the family to the United States, there is a real question as to the wisdom of helping Mr. Frank to emigrate to Cuba alone. The fact that his wife and children will remain in occupied areas abroad would militate against his application for the United States visa from Cuba. On October 17th, Augusta Mayerson wrote to Maurice Krinsky in Boston. He, Maurice was acting as the liaison between the various parties and the Hollander brothers. Mr. and Mrs. Nathan Strauss are very much interested in helping Otto Frank and his family. 
They think it highly desirable to keep the family together. Even after all this money has been deposited and invested, there is still the question as to whether the family could succeed in obtaining the necessary exit permits and transit visas. Letters throughout November work out the details of how Otto Frank alone could obtain a Cuban visa. The Strausses agreed to arrange the bond and pay for transportation costs. The Hollander brothers would pay the attorney fees, visa fees, and outgoing passage fees for Cuba. Ms. Mayerston wrote to Julius on November 12th. It takes from 10 to 21 days to obtain a legal, a legal Cuban visa. We have recently been informed that persons in occupied areas are being denied exit permits. It may be that even after the Franks have obtained Cuban visas, they may fail to obtain the necessary exit permits from Holland. On November 18th, Julius Hollander wrote to the Strausses. The National Refugee Service informed me on November 12th of your decision to contribute in a generous way to the immigration of Mr. Otto Frank and family. The most important issue for the time being is the providing of the exit permits. Because I was advised not to pay for the Cuban visa, before being informed by my brother-in-law that exit permits would be granted, I sent a cable to Amsterdam asking him to make sure that the permits are available. Julius then wrote to the National Refugee Service on the 22nd. I cabled again to make positively sure that exit permits should be given before I would be able to deposit a mount for visas and tickets. Otto Frank's travel agent in Amsterdam cabled. Exit permit can only be given after Cuban visa is sent over. Please care only for Otto Frank for the time being to confine financial risk. Augusta Mayerson cabled Julius on the 27th. If you and brother start negotiations for Cuban visas, Mr. Strauss willing to make necessary deposits for Otto, Edith, Margot, and Frank. It's up to you to start, if interested. Julius Hollander responded the same day. This morning I got a cable from Amsterdam in which Mr. Otto Frank is asking for one visa only because he wants to find out if exit permits are still available. In case they are not available, only $275 will be lost. On the 28th of November, Julius Hollander ordered the Cuban exit permit. Most of 1941 was squandered doing everything the right way. Otto Frank was still trying everything possible to get his family out. He thought he could get to Cuba and then send for his wife, children, and mother-in-law. And although his single visa was finally issued on December 1st, no one knows if it ever reached him. When Germany and Italy declared war on the United States December 11, 1941, Cuba canceled its visa program and the Franks lost their chance. I always have chills by now. They had no other options. Nothing further was heard from Otto Frank until after the war. The story of what happened to the Frank family during the war is well known and will not be retold here. On June 25, 1945, the Migration Department of the National Refugee Service believed that all members of the Frank family had reached Paris. Julius immediately started the process that would finally help his family immigrate. It wasn't until October 24th, three months later, that he learned that Edith had perished and that the children were still listed as missing. On October 25th, Nathan wrote to Otto at Prinzing Rock 263. Both Helen and I were glad to receive your letter and thus have direct personal news of you. We have heard indirectly of the tragic events that have befallen your family. Words are quite useless in such a situation as this. In fact, the huge scale of the tragedy which has befallen innocent people is almost beyond the human mind to encompass. And Otto replied on November 14th. It always does one good if one feels that their old friends will still care about you. I must com not complain. Apart from business, I am very busy copying the diary of my youngest daughter, which was found by chance, and to find an editor for it, I don't give up and try to build again. On February 2nd, 1946, Julius Hollander wrote to the National Refugee Service, who was still trying to arrange immigration for Otto Frank. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, I thank you for your letter of January 31st and the interest you have shown but I am in contact with Otto Frank, and he wants to stay in Amsterdam. 
Otto Frank and Nathan Strauss Jr. continued their personal correspondence throughout the rest of their lives. Nathan was helpful to Otto when Anne's diary was published in English and again when it was made into a play and then a movie. He found a lawyer for Otto Frank when Meyer Levin, a screenwriter, sued him over the manuscript he had proposed for the play. And the Franks lived with the Strausses for two years till they completed the lawsuit. Otto and his second wife, Fritzi, came to the United States several times in the ensuing years, and each time they stayed with the Strausses. Otto's second wife, Fritzi, was also a Holocaust survivor. On one of her first trips to the U.S., she wrote to her daughter in Holland, who was also a survivor, and she said, At noon, we went to the countryside. Helen Strauss and her eldest son picked us up in their car. We drove to her estate. Everything there is like a fairy tale, or like a Hollywood film. Helen and Nathan are very amiable. We also got to know their eldest son, his wife, and his three children. And later, their second son came along with his wife and child. I have to add that all four Strauss children were brought up very well and did not behave as one would expect from American children. <laughs> In May 1957, Otto wrote to Nathan, You certainly will be interested to hear that there is an Anne Frank Foundation being registered with the purpose to buy the house in which we were hiding and to establish an international youth center in it. And of course, I am furnishing funds to buy that house. Nathan contributed generously to Anne Frank House, which Otto Frank established as a place where students could learn tolerance. Otto spent the rest of his days celebrating the life of his daughter Anne through her words. He wanted them to bring tolerance and compassion to a world that had seen so much hatred and war. And he wanted them to show that the human spirit could not be destroyed. Nathan Strauss Jr. died in 1961, and his wife and four sons continued their friendship with Otto and Fritzi until Otto's death in 1980. And today, as you know, The Diary of Anne Frank is a play that is very well received everywhere. The book has been published 75 million copies sold in 60 languages, and that might be a little outdated by now. Anne Frank House in Amsterdam is still one of the most visited destinations in the world, and there are branches of it located around major cities. And it's clear that Anne's story will endure. One can only hope that the message of peace and tolerance that both Anne and her father so fervently prayed for will resonate with the generations that read her words and that they will make a difference. To the end of his days, Anne Frank, Otto Frank was an optimist, and he continued to believe in the goodness of people. And he did it all for the sake of his children. Thank you so much for your time. I'd be happy to respond to questions of this. Yes? You said the letters were discovered in Evo in what year? 2007. And they were redacted at that time? Yes. Before, so many years after? after before, the no one had seen them. And uh, there was some question about ownership and there, there had to be some declassification of all of this. So once they were read, that's when Evo decided to redact those areas. There, there are four letters in particular that are huge areas you know, that, that are redacted. There were 85, so these four particularly. And, and one can only guess it out of Frank's mental state you know, at that time. Yes, any other questions? Well, I thank you all. For coming? I'm yes. Sorry, I do have another question. That's fine. You mentioned very early on that the Strausses were involved in pasteurization. Yes. Why does my memory from school make me think of Louis Pasteur? Well, not the Strausses. Pasteur invented the process that if you heat something but not to boiling, it will kill germs. But he did not take it further than that. Nathan Strauss, the story is Nathan Strauss owned a, a farm, a self-contained farm in the Adirondacks where the family would spend their summers in the early 1890s. And there are several stories. One is that he had cows on this farm that were seemingly healthy, certainly well taken care of, and one died from tuberculosis. And he reasoned at that time that if the tuberculosis was in the cow, that it was probably getting into the milk. Okay? Another story is that his wife in the city took the children to Central Park at the boathouse at the time, where they bought milk for the children, which were kind of bluish in color. And she felt that it didn't look very good, that she was worried about the quality. And if, at that time, there was no regulation whatsoever of dairies. And so cows were not in a field, they were in a barn. 
in their own feces with flies and filth, and the, the people who milked the cows didn't have to be clean. The buckets the milk went into wasn't clean. And Nathan reasoned that if the milk was clean, that would be important. And so he, knowing Louis Pasteur, took this process, created pasteurization, coined the phrase, opened up milk stations in New York City, then went to other cities in the country, and then around the world, and said, I will build you a milk pasteurization lab if you will send people to learn the process. And this took more than 20 years for it all to be accepted because <coughs> there was very little regulation. But Nathan Strauss is the one who coined the term pasteurization and brought it to the world. Among, and that's why he was in Heidelberg. He had opened a pasteurization lab in Heidelberg and was going around Germany and some of the countries in that area trying to get, get uh, cities to learn to pasteurize milk. Yeah. Just a comment. I don't know if you're familiar with or aware that uh, Anne Frank had a stepsister. And the stepsister's name was Eva Slosh. And it was the marriage of Otto Frank after the Holocaust. Right. To a woman he knew. Right. And this, the woman had a child. Her name was Eva. And she's written a book. Right. And, and she's going around speaking. And a lot of the information right. is about Anne Frank, what she was like as right. a child and right. so forth, and how they grew up together right. and were best friends. Yes, yes. Yeah. And she's, she's been in, in this area giving that talk. I know she was in Rock, Rockport. Rockford? Rockford. Rockford. Rockford giving that talk, and I know she's been elsewhere. There is, by the way, if you're interested and want to read further, there are many, many books, but one that, that is out fairly recently and is quite amazing is called Treasures in the Attic. And it was written by Mary, Miriam Pressler, uh, who helped with the translation of Anne Frank Diary. Uh, the story is that Lenny, Otto's sister, went to Basel, and their mother came and lived with them in Basel. And when the mother died, they went into the attic of this house and they found, I can't remember, something like 6,000 letters and photographs and things. And so they wrote the story. And it's written in the, by Mary Pressler with Otto, uh, with uh, Eric Elias's uh, buddy, he's now called Buddy, not Eric, but uh, with, with the wife, Gerda. And uh, it's quite an amazing story, among other things, because he was the first cousin of Anne, and he writes about their being together on family vacations because before all this. Unfortunately, Buddy Elias just passed away within the past month. He was quite a remarkable person, but if you are interested, I highly recommend Treasures in the Attic. Yeah. How or, how or why have you been involved with the Strauss Foundation? You're not related? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not related. Um, my training is in special education. And when I had children, it was during an era when women could stay home with their children. And I did. I was quite lucky. Uh, but when they got to be about junior high school age, I started to get worried that my brain was going to atrophy if I didn't do anything. And so just because I really didn't want to go back to work, per se, and I wanted to be home with my kids, I invented a job. This was in the very early 80s, before computers, before internet. Well, before internet. And I put an ad in the New York Times in the book review saying that I would do research for people. And people would contact me and ask me to read some books and write a report. And it was fabulous. And I didn't have to work on holidays or weekends or summer. And the things people asked about were just incredible. I mean, it was so interesting. And one of the people who called me in 1990 was a man named Robert K. Strauss, who lived in Santa Barbara. And his family were the Strauss family. And he explained to me that the family had owned Macy's up until 1986, when there had been a very, very bitter leverage buyout. And on a handshake, the family was promised all of their personal papers and artifacts after the deal was all signed. But since it was so bitter, the people who bought them out reneged on that. And so from 86 to 90, he had been hiring people to try and get these family papers out. Uh, and he called me and said, do you think you could do that? And I said, I haven't a clue. And I said, but if you will put me in touch with somebody inside Macy's who is still loyal to the family, I'll go talk to that person, and we'll see. And here I am. <laughs> it just started a fabulous, fabulous 25 years. It's been amazing. In 1998, we became a 501c3. So we are now for profit. And, and it's wonderful. Family is fantastic family. We have... We have Two members of the family sitting in the front row here. Greenabout 
and uh, they're very supportive and they're very interested in everything we do. And we, we have a website which I encourage you to visit. We we have all sorts of materials. I write a newsletter twice a year, 12 pages of history and current events about the family, and everything is posted. My my wonderful, wonderful assistant, Catherine Smith, who's in the back, is the person who really makes me look intelligent because she knows how to do all this wonderful internet stuff. And, and uh, so she's posted videos on YouTube with various other talks that we do, and, and she's posted all of our back newsletters. So if you're interested, and you can see the audit, the August 2007 article that led to the book and, and all sorts of other information about the Strauss's. Some of it is really quite fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.